I'd like to thank Aaron Parker for working so hard to get Bobby and I together in order to have a conversation. Without Aaron, the episode would have never taken place. Thank you, Aaron. The Lauren Agee case was hastily closed by authorities, but many questions remain. Come behind the curtain with private investigator Sheila Waisaki as she uncovers the truth about what happened to Lauren. This is Without Warning. Warning. The following episode contains details about sexual violence and elements that are graphic in nature. On the last episode, we heard from former FBI agent Bobby Chacon. I want to take a moment and thank Bobby for watching the depositions, going over the case, and giving his opinion. Bobby answered many of your questions from the law enforcement perspective. There are still many questions to answer. On this episode, I'm going to have Selena introduce herself and have her ask me questions that you all have posted on social media, our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook accounts. Hi, I'm Selena, and I'm a PI in training. Jordan Stewart asks, as someone who has a degree in this field, has a career in this area, when you sit in a classroom, start your training, and begin your on-the-job training, the first subject you go over is your communications with coworkers, witnesses, victims. Is that a conversation or interrogation does not exist if you do not write it down or record the conversation? How does Jeremy Taylor justify not doing this? Jeremy Taylor not writing the information down is actually not protocol in any police department. I've checked with several across the country, and not one of them said that it was okay not to document or record conversations with witnesses or record what you're doing. So the fact that Jeremy Taylor did not write anything down is against protocol in Tennessee and all over the country. Actually, I think the fact that we're having this conversation about Jeremy Taylor not writing down or documenting anything is ridiculous because every person out there listening has watched a Law & Order or some crime show, and they know to document and record. The fact that Jeremy Taylor did not know is beyond anyone listening. And here's another one. In connection with that by Katie Bona, is there any written report taken by the officers who were actually present at the crime scene while Lauren's body was still there? Or is the only documentation that of Jeremy Taylor's starting after the body was already removed? We do have the first responder pictures, but we have no documentation whatsoever in writing other than when the kids went to the campers, went to the police department and wrote the less than a paragraph about what happened that weekend. Kelly Hammock Murphy asks, will there be a deposition on the other detective? Unfortunately, the lawsuit was dropped because Sherry felt like she was being singled out and intimidated. Haley Villacorta says, I saw a news story just a few weeks ago with Farrier Files where he stated that the family has an individual that has come forward who witnessed what happened that night, but the family does not know who to bring this information to. That has always stuck out to me. Is that accurate? This is the clip of Dennis Farrier of Farrier Files, Fox 17. The family says they have a witness who told them what happened that night, but they don't know who to take it to. I'm Dennis Ferrier, Fox 17 News. The family has information that would move the case forward, but they don't have anyone to take it to. So you can't take it to DeKalb or the DA. So you're kind of stuck out in where do you go land? And hopefully the FBI will step in. Jennifer asks a couple of questions in this. We'll start with, did you ask Hannah why Aaron told her to stick to the story? I did not ask Hannah why Aaron told her to stick to the story. I think that statement speaks for itself. I don't feel like I need to have Hannah tell me what it means. It means exactly what he said. They had a story and just stick with it. 
Did you give the police this information that Erin was telling her to stick to the story? I made an appointment with the district attorney in DeKalb County, went to his office, sat down with him, told the DA what I knew, and asked him if I could speak to his investigator. His answer was no. He informed me that he was not going to let me speak to his investigator. At that point, I knew it was a worthless meeting. Sheriff Patrick Ray does have everything that we have because of the lawsuit. It's public record. The judge has it, the DA has it, and the sheriff has it. Angie Renee Gant asks, when is the sheriff up for re-election or was he elected in this past election? It is so unfortunate that Sheriff Patrick Ray was re-elected in August. Hopefully, we'll be able to get people to start listening to the podcast because it's important for them to know who they vote for. Karen Larson asks, Lauren and Hannah went to the event in Lauren's car. Lauren planned on staying only Friday night and coming home Saturday to attend her current boyfriend's party. Did Hannah plan on only staying one night? Hannah had planned to meet with Aaron and go home with Aaron, so she already had other plans to stay the weekend. Why didn't Lauren drive home when she told people that she wanted to leave? In an earlier episode, Aaron Lilly told Jeremy Taylor that he took the keys away from Lauren. Lauren could not leave Wakefest in her car to go back to Hendersonville because she did not have her keys. Lauren Mueller asks, this is a huge question for me. She was hanging out with Evan at the bar Saturday night. She wasn't being held against her will or anything at that point, but she certainly should have left for Chase's house by then. At what point did she change her mind about leaving Wakefest? Why? And why didn't she tell Chase? Okay, so I cannot answer all the questions about Lauren and what she did and did not do. And I want to be very careful not to blame Lauren. I believe that her keys were taken from her. She did ask some people to stay with them that night. And she probably felt like nothing was going to happen. At that age, you don't believe that you're going to get into a bad situation. Lauren definitely made some mistakes. But she's also a kid. Most kids make mistakes. And the mistakes don't generally add up to you're found at the bottom of the cliff dead. Lisa Ledbetter Travis asks, this may be dumb, but what is the role of a sheriff's department versus regular law enforcement like a police department? A sheriff's department is elected. A police department is not. And the roles are the same. You conduct an investigation exactly the same Investigations don't change based on departments. It's just a matter of who's in charge, how they conduct their business, and the good ones, they get training. And secondly, in fact, is the training provided by a sheriff's department at the discretion of the sheriff, or does the state oversee that type of training? Because as everyone has pointed out, there obviously was no training for Jeremy Taylor. Where is justice if the people trying to find out the truth are so inept? And secondly, is the training provided by a sheriff's department at the discretion of the sheriff, or does the state oversee that type of training? Tennessee has guidelines, and it's up to the sheriff's department how much money they're going to spend on training. And third, did a different medical examiner find the cause of death to be different from the original ME? So we brought in other experts, and they disagree with the initial medical examiner's report. We're not going to go into that at this point, but we'll talk about it when we do the episode on the medical examiner in Nashville. Allison Richardson Lines says, I want to know more about Hannah's family, what her parents do. Do they come from money, local political ties, etc.? There have been a lot of questions about Aaron's parents and Hannah's parents, Brick's parents. I am not going to discuss the parents. I'm sure you can Google them and find out information. Laura Rope Smith has a couple of questions. 
The interviews with Hannah, she said various times that they woke up and she didn't know what happened to Lauren. She stated that they thought she went back to find her ex-boyfriend that night, maybe. When interviewing the houseboat owners that were there, the daughter said she asked where the other girl was, and they said the same, oh, we think she went back to find her ex-boyfriend. Immediately, all I thought of was the canoe. They woke up and the canoe was there. If they thought Lauren left the campsite after they all fell asleep, she would have had to canoe back herself. So did the canoe magically row itself back to them? Did they think she swam back while drunk at 4 a.m.? This question is driving me nuts. I love that question. So if you listen again to my conversation with Hannah, one of the things that I asked her in the morning was the canoe there? Because we all know, and I agree with you, how did the canoe get there if Lauren left in the middle of the night to go see her ex-boyfriend? The canoe was there, but she did not say yes or no. She nodded her head. That was it. We all know that the canoe being there in the morning is a problem. Remember, also in the interview I did with Hannah, she said she thought she got up and peed in the middle of the night and fell. So if your friend in the middle of the night peed and fell, wouldn't you look for her in the morning or notify the police officer that you saw the night before that you think your friend's missing? But instead, she got on a boat, and we have pictures of her and Chris, Bricks, Aaron on a boat having a big old time. And wouldn't you have seen her body when she's floating there and when you're back and forth from the campsite all day? Susan Marsh asks, do you have your own theory on what happened to Lauren based on your investigation to date that you can share publicly? I have my theory, and I'm not going to share it publicly. I think you guys are getting it because I'm getting emails on people asking, and y'all are amazing at figuring this out. Another question is, if Lauren's body was exhumed, are bodies still preserved as well as they were in the past? And if so, what could be found that could lead to charges? Exhuming the body has been asked about a lot since Bobby's episode. Yes, you can exhume a body, and it probably was preserved very well. Potentially, there is evidence. If Sherry decides to exhume the body... She would have to have in place someone to do it because it's not going to be done by the Nashville Medical Examiner's Office. It would have to be done by a private company and a place to do it. Right now, who do you trust? Not one person in this situation has stepped up to do the right thing. I mean, there's just a lot that goes into it. You can't just say, okay, I'm exhuming a body. You have to plan it out. If Sherry exhumes the body and they find evidence, we're at square one again. Who do you take it to? Leanne asks, did anyone take one of the campers and say, okay, show me where the girls went to pee. Show me where you went to change clothes. Show me the morning routine, et cetera. Show me. The simple answer is no. Not one person from DeKalb County asked to be shown anything, and you would make an excellent investigator. That is key to starting out an investigation. When I did interviews with different people that were there that weekend, I asked them to show me on paper exactly where they were, what they did, where Lauren was last seen. So I have sketches of where she was, where Hannah was. I had Hannah show me exactly where she thought Lauren had fallen and where they were. So I have that, but the police never did that, no. So there's a question about the 600 boats possibly being in the marina area and that the currents pushed her body into the second cove. Is that possible? That's a fantastic question. I'm so glad someone brought that up. What people don't understand that's listening to the podcast is just how far out Wakefest was. So the marina is in one area, and you go at least six to 10 miles away from the marina. So all those boats are 10 miles away. We had someone look at all those factors and only went on scientific evidence. Lauren's body would not have ended up in the second cove based on science. I take all the witnesses, the preliminary witnesses, and I 
talk to him to see what they said, see if it was possible for Lorne to have fallen into the water and then floated over to the second cove. I don't want to take a case that I'm going to come back later and say to the mom, hey, guess what? Your daughter did fall. It was better for me to find out at the very beginning. So I retraced all the steps that I was told based on witnesses going to the marina, going up to the cliff, looking around, taking all the stuff that Sherry had done, all the stuff that Michael Sands, the other private investigator they got early on, took his information and went up and retraced everything. Every area we were told that Lauren was, we threw that dummy. We also took a lighter weight buoy to see if you could make it down the cliff. What people don't understand about the cliff is it's at an angle. It's not a straight drop. It's kind of like a, like Bobby said, you know, you have a little landing with a beach area. There's a very short area and the rocks are all so jagged. You can't go up there without, you know, nicking yourself or scratching yourself. I put water jugs. This is initially when I took the case to see the currents. You could test the currents. Had they tested the currents that day, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So since I wasn't there that day, I went and spoke to different fishermen and people that lived in DeKalb around the marina who are actual witnesses to what happened in the water that day based on the currents, not Lauren, but the currents. From the autopsy photos from Patreon, you see that she has a busted nose and lip. Is there speculation that perhaps she was punched and then fell and got the injuries that she sustained? So the question about the autopsy photos, I want to be clear on what's being shown first. The autopsy photos that we're sharing on Patreon are photos that are not inappropriate or disrespectful to Lauren, but they do show true evidence. So things are blurred out, cropped, but you're getting the idea of what happened. And in the autopsy report that has also been given to the Patreon people, they noticed that there is no record of her nose being broken. And if you look at it and we do a video showing the difference, you can see there was trauma to her nose and a split lip. I don't think it takes somebody who has a medical degree to look at something like that and know whether or not someone has been harmed in their nose and lip. You can physically see it. So that's another area that we'll discuss when we do the autopsy medical examiner episode. Is a punch in the nose something you would commonly use if you were going to rape someone? A punch in the nose is a great way to stun someone, shut them up, and dominate them. Generally, women will slap one another. They don't go for the nose punch. And I believe someone out there is going to say, well, couldn't it have been from a fall? So had she fallen and broken her nose and split her lips, there would be more cuts on her face. There would be scrapes. The pictures, I believe, speak for themselves. Yes, I did talk to TWRA. And I will say this, in the whole time of doing this investigation, TWRA has been the one agency that has cooperated and been helpful. So not only did I talk to some people at TWRA, I also was given access to the boat that Lauren was transported from where she was found to the ambulance. So I have pictures of that boat. Did law enforcement determine if there was blood or any evidence on the canoe? So in order to find out if there was any evidence on the canoe, that would mean you would have to actually look at the canoe. And we know that Jeremy Taylor, through his deposition, did not do that. If you later learned Lauren had hemorrhaging in her throat, would you have taken steps to investigate that? Oh, absolutely. I would have been there with the medical examiner to see what the conclusions were. 
So this is a question based on the Patreon meeting last week when we were examining Lauren's markings on her chest. Some believe it's from a canoe. Some believe it's from the boat that she was transported in because there's a square that could look like a triangle. So when the photos were enlarged, we sort of noticed that it was both. And we need to figure out, or maybe you know, at what point after death will markings on the skin disappear? So I'm going to address how amazing it is to use crowdsourcing. And I know there are some law enforcement agencies that poo-poo the idea of the general public participating in cases. I happen to be different. I believe in crowdsourcing because of what happened this weekend at our meet and greet. I got to meet the Patreon participants and we were discussing the controversial canoe marking on Lauren's body. Maybe both sides right. So because the Patreon people are so aware of this case, they were able to separate from the pictures I took from TWRA and canoe pictures and merge them into one. So what we're doing is, with that information, because of this weekend, we're going to show it to our medical examiner to see if, in fact, they could be both. Again, crowdsourcing is the way to get cold cases solved. And the people that participated or are part of this, I can't thank them enough. And also, the Patreon people that spend hours helping are the most amazing people. And a lot of new members are coming in and getting the information. And it this group is very interactive. And they bring up stuff all the time. Why it wouldn't be commonplace to have law enforcement utilize resources like this, I'm not sure. John Lorden and Gray Hughes both do YouTube channels. Both have been following Lauren's case, and the canoe markings has been a back and forth with all three of us, and we're going to get together on, I'm not sure if it's John Lorden's show or Gray Hughes or both, but all three of us are going to go over the pictures and discuss them. So when that happens, I will announce it. Why were there so few photos taken on top of the crime scene and so many taken below? Was that because TWRA took a lot of photos and the sheriff's office didn't take any? The photos taken were taken by the first responders. The ones on top of the cliff were taken by Jeremy Taylor. And some of them are blurry, kind of haphazard. You'll see pictures of Aaron and Hannah inside the crime scene tape. Kind of shows the way they were handling the investigation. There are some questions that have arisen, especially from Chris Yarchuk, about the movement of Lauren's items on top of the hill after law enforcement got there. Do you know anything about that? We'll have an episode with Chris Yarchuk where he can kind of go through the movements of that day. But the most shocking information that came out of the meeting I had with Chris Yarchuk was two things. Number one, there were two campsites. Number two, Lauren's shoes were at campsite number one, not campsite number two where the tents and where a sleeping bag were found. So obviously he's a fantastic eyewitness and I believe that he would know where he saw her shoes. Wasn't Chris Yarchuk the last person besides her friends to have seen Lauren? No. Chris Yarchuk was the last authority to see Lauren alive, but the people on the houseboat were the last people to ever interact with Lauren before she went over to the cliff. Chelsea Stark brought up a good point about if law enforcement's theory is that she fell while she was peeing, why were her pants up? Great question. And that's somebody who's paying attention. If Lauren had been peeing, holding on to the tree, as Hannah showed me, her pants would be down. But what's interesting about that is Lauren's biological father, Brian, said that had Lauren wanted to pee, 
She had no inhibitions. She would have just peed right there, wherever she was standing. She wouldn't have gone to the pee area. Where's Hannah's appeal? The first case that went in front of Judge Jonathan Young was Hannah's. The judge threw out all of Sherry's case. Sherry Smith decided to appeal it. That appeal was heard in October. Sherry has not heard from the appellate court whether or not that case will go forward. Is it possible to sue a sheriff's department? In the state of Tennessee, you cannot sue a police department for not doing their job. One of the questions I get over and over is the autopsy. So I am bringing on Mark Gillespie to answer those questions. He has both forensic and investigative skills. I have worked with Mark and I know that he has integrity and also a dedication to this industry. Crowdsourcing is such a valuable tool and I believe in investigative work, it is so needed. So I appreciate the people from Patreon coming out last weekend, sitting down and brainstorming. It was, first of all, so nice to meet so many of you. And secondly, it was amazing what came out of that meeting. I look forward to utilizing the crowdsourcing venue again. Lauren's family gives their full permission for any and all details to be shared and hope that the truth will come out. If you know anything at all, call 1-888-599-0008 or email tips at sheilawysaki.com. Next time on Without Warning. My name is Mark Gillespie, private investigator. I'm the owner and manager of Gillespie Security and Investigations in the Austin Texas area. My background is I spent a career in the Air Force. I was a special agent for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, commanded investigative units in the U.S. and overseas. I retired in 1996, upon which time I became the forensic science director for the Austin Police Department. I did that for about eight years and left APD to start a forensic science degree program at St. Edwards University in Austin, where I taught forensic science and criminal investigations for about eight years. And then uh, I began my PI career in 2004 while I was still teaching at St. Edwards and learned that it was hard. After doing it for about five years, simultaneously learned it was difficult to do two full-time jobs. So I left teaching to pursue my PI career. And I am happy that I did that. I specialize in criminal defense, cold cases, missing persons, human trafficking. You know, I've been a a great follower of Sheila Wysocki's Without Warning, the case of Lauren Agee's death. And I'm just appalled at the lack of investigative expertise of that case displayed by the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office. I've been very opinionated about how that case was pursued. And I think some comments I made recently are very mild in comparison to how I really feel about the incompetence level, primarily the sheriff and Jeremy Taylor. We should not have people that serve the public that perform like this. It's just incredulous.